One of the challenging aspects of getting an autoimmune diagnosis is you may be told you have something that you've never heard of before. In fact, unless it's lupus or rheumatoid arthritis, pretty much no one has heard of the autoimmune conditions I care for. Vasculitis is one of those types of conditions. The term vasculitis is actually a broad term that covers many different conditions and can even occur in those with lupus or RA. So I want to spend time today breaking down what vasculitis is, how your rheumatologist thinks about it, and what are some common symptoms to look out for. I'm Dr. Elizabeth Ortiz, and this is Connected Rheumatology. Let's get started. When talking about vasculitis, it can be easy to get confused very quickly. The names of the different conditions are a mouthful, like eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangiitis. But let's not overcomplicate it. Vasculitis is simply inflammation of the blood vessels. Our blood vessels make up our vascular system, which is what supplies blood to all parts of our body. Our blood carries oxygen, so the blood vessels allow for oxygen to get to our organs and then allows the produced carbon dioxide to get back to our lungs. The vessels that carry oxygen to our body are called arteries, and the ones that carry carbon dioxide back to our lungs are veins. Aside from the distinction between arteries and veins, we distinguish vessels by their size and their strength. Generally speaking, our strongest, largest blood vessels are closest to our heart, and then as the vessels branch out, they get smaller and flimsier. And I don't say flimsy to mean they're actually flimsy, but it's all relative. The tiny capillaries don't have the same sturdiness as our aorta that comes straight off our heart. We can get inflammation of any of our blood vessels, and this can happen for a number of different reasons, with autoimmunity being one of them. When we get autoimmune inflammation in our vessels, it tends to either only hit our big blood vessels or only our small ones. So our autoimmune vasculitis conditions are divided by whether they attack large or small vessels. So now that we have a basic understanding of our blood vessels, let's get into the actual vasculitic conditions. And yes, get ready for some big names. So as I was saying, because for whatever reason, when we get vasculitis, we tend to only get either inflammation in our big blood vessels or our small ones, we divide up the conditions into large vessel vasculitis and small vessel vasculitis. The large vessel vasculitides are giant cell arteritis, Takayasu's arteritis, and although it's considered a medium vessel vasculitis, I'll throw it in to simplify things, and that's Kawasaki's disease. The small vessel vasculitis names are even better. So small vessel vasculitides are granulomatosis with polyangiitis, or what we used to call Wegner's, eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangiitis, or what we used to call church strauss Small vessel vasculitis can be seen with a particular antibody called the ANCA, the A-N-C-A. And you will sometimes hear us collectively call them ANCA vasculitis. There's also cryolobulinemic vasculitis, IgA vasculitis, and microscopic polyangiitis. So you can see it's a mouthful. Of all of these, the one people may have heard of, if they've heard of any, is giant cell arteritis because it can sometimes happen with polymyalgia rheumatica, which is a common inflammatory disorder that can hit after the age of 65. So although I wouldn't expect you to finish this video and be able to spout out every vasculitis condition's name, I do hope we can break down how we go about diagnosing these conditions and what symptoms you may actually feel. I also want to mention that small vessel vasculitis in particular can happen as part of other autoimmune conditions. It can be seen in lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, and even myositis. This just becomes another manifestation or flavor of your lupus or RA and can change your treatment strategy. So you're probably thinking, uh, this is all great Ortiz, but how do I know if I have poly uh, vessel, what should I do? Well, although this framework isn't perfect, which you'll quickly see, I do think it's helpful to understand the distinction between big and small vessel vasculitis because the symptoms and the complications we see are a result of the inflamed vessel, where it is and what it does. So let's start with small vessel vasculitis. In general, these small blood vessels are the blood vessels of our skin, around our nerves, in our lungs, and in our kidneys which means that when those blood vessels get inflamed, we can see problems pop up in our skin, our nerves, our lungs, and our kidneys. 
When this happens in our skin, we can develop what some may call a rash, but I don't typically think of it as an itchy rash you may get from an allergic reaction, but more it's a skin change that is a result of the inflammation in the tiny blood vessels of the skin. We can get red spots that we call purpura or petechiae. These most commonly occur in our legs, but I have certainly seen them in other parts of the body. They aren't itchy and sometimes I, people haven't even noticed them until I point them out. They can become severe and lead to very large spots or areas of the skin that don't get enough blood flow that then leads to the skin breaking down and developing ulcers, but this isn't as common as just simple petechiae. When the blood vessels around the nerves get inflamed, they can lead to the nerve to dysfunction, which can lead to nerve pain, a tingling sensation, or difficulty moving, and this usually happens in the legs. Now, I'm gonna geek out on you for a second. So when I was in third year of medical school, I saw my very first rheumatology patient, and it was someone with small vessel vasculitis. He had difficulty walking because his foot didn't bend as it should because the nerves of his foot weren't working properly. And the reason they weren't working was because the tiny blood vessels that surround the nerve were inflamed due to his condition. When I wrapped my head around the fact that even his nerves have tiny, tiny blood vessels that fed it oxygen, because of course, the nerves need oxygen too, duh. When I was really understood that, it's like it unlocked my whole brain and I was hooked. And I've pretty much been obsessed with rheumatology ever since. When the blood vessels in the kidneys become inflamed, this can cause the kidney to dysfunction, which we can see in blood and urine tests, but also with foot and leg swelling or fluid retention in our lungs. But we can also get vasculitis in our lungs, and when this happens, we can bleed into our lungs, which is one of the very few rheumatology emergencies we have. You see, an inflamed small blood vessel becomes weak, and it's easily broken. When this happens, we can bleed. And when this happens a lot in the lungs, well, we can bleed a lot in the lungs. The point I'm highlighting is that the symptoms you feel are a result of the organ that may be dysfunctioning as a result of the inflammation of the small blood vessels that feed that organ. This holds true to a certain extent with big vessel vasculitis as well. So for example, we can get headaches and even strokes from big vessel vasculitis in our head and neck area, and we can get numbness in our arms and legs from poor circulation. But we are also going to get a lot of what doctors call constitutional symptoms. These are general symptoms of inflammation like fevers, weight loss, and fatigue. And by the way, small vessel vasculitis can also get these general symptoms too. And it makes sense, right? You're gonna feel like crud if your blood vessels are inflamed. Blood tests tend to show lots of inflammation but they don't really point exactly to where the problem is. Which gets me to diagnosing vasculitis. The first step is your doctor needs to have a very high level of suspicion, meaning they need to be thinking about it. There are some blood tests we can check specifically for small vessel vasculitis, but they aren't perfect. And you can certainly still have vasculitis even if those tests are negative. What I used to tell my residents and fellows is, find me the vasculitis, meaning that we need to go hunting. We chase down every clue and ultimately either get a good picture of it with an MRI or a PET scan or get a biopsy. So is there evidence that there's inflammation in the skin and kidneys? Well, then get me a biopsy of those. If there's vasculitis, I'm going to see inflammation in and around the blood vessels of the skin and the kidneys. Are the pulses and blood pressure of someone's arms different? then get me an angiogram of the blood vessels in their chest and arms. Because the blood tests for vasculitis are so nonspecific, we need to see either the inflammation directly in the blood vessel in a biopsy, or the changes to a blood vessel as a consequence of the inflammation in an image like an MRI or PET scan. Once we found it, then I tell my trainees, find me all the places where it is. Because of course everyone is different. Some people just have it in their kidneys, some in their kidneys and nerves, some in their nerves, kidneys, and lungs. You, you get the idea. Knowing all the organs that are affected will help me decide which treatment is best and what to follow. Bottom line, just because you get a diagnosis that you've never heard of doesn't mean you're on your own. 
we do have a framework and approach to vasculitis that allows us to one, identify it, and two, find where it is so that we can develop the right treatment plan. Treatment for vasculitis is a whole other can of worms that I'll have to tackle in a different video. But if you'd like to learn more about polymyalgia rheumatica, the condition that we often see associated with giant cell arteritis, I recommend this video next. As always, thanks, and I'll see you next time.